Snow in the weather forecast causes area schools to cancel classes and activities. And UNCP responds to the threat of coronavirus from China. Those stories are coming up on Carolina News Today. Plus, UNC Charlotte has its own viral threat to contend with. I'm Samantha DeBusk. And I'm Ecstasia Benjamin. Stay tuned. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper tried to assure residents this week that the state was prepared for snow effects. At a press conference Thursday, he also gave tips on being prepared with storm kits in your car. Cooper stressed the differences in impact that would be felt in different climate zones. The entire state is under either a winter storm advisory or warning through tomorrow morning. This winter storm will affect most parts of North Carolina. Effects could be minor in many places, but will be more significant in other places. We expect the heaviest snows after sunset. Northeastern North Carolina might get the greatest impact, where three to six inches of snow are possible in the forecast. School officials in the region made decisions Wednesday to have early dismissal on Thursday to make sure buses were off the roads before freezing temperatures or snow. Robinson and Cumberland County schools closed two hours early. This morning they had a delay opening and Scotland County Thursday was already set to be a half day for parent teacher conferences, which were then canceled. Friday was already a scheduled day off for students in Scotland County and a required teacher work day. UNCP canceled Thursday night classes and resumed regular operations at 10 a.m. Thanks to our studio crew for showing up this morning to make it our show happen. UNCP has canceled some travel and classes for another reason. The threat of this new coronavirus that's traced to China. CNT reporter Mason Miller tells us about the university's response to the for the potential of the infection. The global death toll for the coronavirus is now over 2,100 people. While the number of cases now exceeds 70,000, it's unclear when the growing pandemic threat will stop. Because of the virus's wildfire spread across China, the university has, quote, placed a ban on all university-sponsored travel through China for the spring semester. Director of Student Health Services Corp Buller explains some misconceptions around the virus and what students should be aware of. Bullard says that the possibility of the virus spreading to Pembroke is low. However, she warns that students should still be precautious. Well, for one thing, the coronavirus um, is a, it's a very low risk here on our campus. Mm. Um, the main risk is in China. But here at UNCP, we don't want to always take chances on anything, so we're always looking out for our campus community. So we're always doing things that can actually um, help us be prepared if anything does happen. Um, one of the things that students can do to prevent any kind of virus is hand washing. Okay. Hand washing is the number one thing that you can do to prevent that. Okay. And a lot of individuals would think washing their hands for five seconds works. Most times we tell individuals to wash their hands for 20 seconds. So count to 20 while you're washing your hands. The Braves Health Center also warns of some common misconceptions about the coronavirus. I think there are some misconceptions. I think people, when they see Asian individuals, they automatically think of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a real misconception because we've got um, Asian individuals here in North Carolina and the United States has been here all of their life. Um, so a misconception is actually looking at the individual thinking that they may have something when they don't. Because of the ban, the Office of Global Engagement's study abroad trip to China has been suspended. The trip would have taken place this May to Beijing and Harbin. Bullard says that the medical masks people wear are also effective in preventing the spread of illnesses. The masks are effective for those individuals who are sick when they come into our clinic, we give them a mask to wear. It's also recommended that health professionals wear a mask when they're taking care of sick individuals. We're always looking out for our students and, and the safety of our campus, um, just like with the Ebola and pandemic flu and H1N1 and just the regular flu. Um, if you look over campus and look at our website, you can always refer back to things that can help individuals um, notice symptoms of viruses and then, like I said, prevention as far as making sure that they do hand, wa hand washing. Now you heard Cora say the masks that people wear around their mouths are effective in preventing against various types of illnesses and viruses. For more tips on how you can avoid the coronavirus, visit the Braves Health Center website. For WNCP-TV, I'm Mason Miller. The state of North Carolina has created a task force to work alongside federal agencies to prepare for this virus. 
Although they're not necessarily expecting anything, state officials encourage the public to take the same safety precautions used for common cold and flu to prevent infection from spreading. For example, washing your hands for at least 20 seconds, covering your mouth and nose with a tissue or your sleeve when sneezing or coughing, and staying home when you're sick. 57 Americans were able to leave Camp Ashland in Nebraska Thursday as their two-week coronavirus quarantine ended. Camp Ashland is a National Guard training facility where the Centers for Disease Control set up a team to test and monitor Americans who were flown in from Wuhan, China. The team leader said it's been 14 days and now the patients can go to the Omaha airport and head on home from there. The really important thing to know is that uh, 57 people arrived here for quarantine and 57 healthy people are going back to their communities. Um, and, and the really, really important thing to know is that these people pose no health threat. The North the Mecklen County Public Health Department is investigating two potential cases of tuberculosis at UNC Charlotte. The university says the two affected individuals both reside off campus and are currently receiving treatment following standard isolation protocol. The health department says most people who come in contact with the bacterial infection are not affected. In most cases, the disease is cured with an appropriate medical treatment. North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein has asked U.S. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos to forgive federal loans for all students who were enrolled in the former Dream Center schools that are now closed. In 2018, the Dream Center nonprofit abruptly closed its arts institutes in Charlotte and Raleigh and South University in High Point. Former students may be eligible for complete discharge of their federal student loans. If they were enrolled when the school closed or if they were on an approved leave of absence, Stein and state attorneys in 26 other states have asked Secretary DeVos to go further and provide debt relief to all Dream Center students who didn't have time to graduate before the schools failed. Syracuse University has reversed a decision to suspend students who were protesting the school's handling of a series of racist incidents. Wednesday, the chancellor lifted the interim suspensions. He said suspensions procedures would be stopped in order to de-escalate the whole situation. The building where students conducted their sit-in is has returned to normal operation. Demonstrators criticized the administration's handling of a series of racist incidents that began late last semester. Another six bias incidents have been reported since mid-January. Chancellor Silver announced that some Perpetrators have been found and punished, but the school is still trying to identify at least one more. Here at UNCP, an intimate concert showcased local performing artists Sunday in Moore Hall. The event was sponsored by the Robinson County Arts Council. CNT reporter Brian Pittman has more. Mark Anderson and Lakota John have been performing together for about two years now, and the two of them, along with other local artists, felt a lasting impression last Sunday at the River Voices concert at UNCP's Moore Hall. He was a personality that I really wanted to work with, and so I started composing music especially for him. We perform with this group every month. We are doing one of these concerts in each one of the towns in Robeson County. Uh, it's being sponsored by the Robeson County Arts Council, and uh, they are bringing us into each one of the, the cities of Robeson County to do a concert this year. Mark told us that his journey in music started about 60 years ago in Lumberton, North Carolina and has carried him to places like Paris, Boston, and New York City. Lakota John was also drawn to music at an early age and was influenced by a large and diverse group of musicians. Well, I love, uh, I grew up listening to the Alma Brothers, Leonard Skinner, a lot of uh, 60s and 70s stuff. And then I found myself going to a lot of the old, original you know, music, stuff out of the early 1900s, you know. Louis Armstrong and uh, some Jelly Roll Morton and Wine Boy Fuller and um, and man, I just started and I love D'Angelo. You know, I like music so child. I like all kinds of different things, classical music, and so to incorporate all of these elements together and you know mash them all up and kind of make my own thing. For Robinson County residents, the River Voices concert provides a unique blend of homegrown talent. Be sure to catch them at a location near you. 
For Carolina News Today, I'm Brian Pittman. Thursday, the Pembroke Activity Council hosted a Rhythm and Jazz Showcase in partnership with the University Chapter of the NAACP. It was a Black History Month event at, U at the UC that got in just under the wire with people trying to get off campus ahead of the snow. Performers included the student-run group called Vocal Harmony, the University Jazz Choir, and spoken word performances by the student organization Inkwell. As university officials prepare to accept a new freshman class, freshman orientation leaders are already preparing to welcome those students and get them acclimated. They held a weekend retreat to focus on team building and effective communication. Head orientation leader Destiny Chavis says she found it valuable as a bonding experience and it helped her set her expectations. We had capabilities of getting to know who we're working with this coming up summer a little better and on a more personal level because we did have a few sessions where it did get personal and so I felt like it um, gave us the ability to open up to each other and to learn a new aspect and side to each other so that we're better prepared for the upcoming summer and having that ability as like I said as a head orientation leader just helps me as a supervisor to know who works best with who, who has you know other issues going on that may prevent them from doing their best job at work so this whole retreat just was a great opportunity for us to know all those aspects about everyone. Dozens of nails dumped in a Charlotte parking lot cause a dangerous scenario. And what would you do if you found $5,000 at work? Would you try to find the rightful owner? One woman in Kentucky did. Those stories and more from around the country, right after this. Campus engagement and leadership is a team, and our mission is to provide experiences for students in a values-based and student-centered environment. Together we are a brave nation because serving students is our passion. We encourage students to connect with peers, faculty, staff, the campus community, and beyond. Getting connected means identifying your interests and matching them with a multitude of opportunities here at UNC Pembroke. Engaged students never stop learning. Being engaged means celebrating the culture of campus through personal and group exploration. Leadership at UNC Pembroke is about creating a legacy that will leave both the campus and the community better than you found it. Leading means working with others in a supportive community to create positive change. Connect to opportunities, engage in exploration, and lead your community. Together, we are changing lives through education. Dozens of nails dumped across a parking lot in North Carolina. Police call it highly dangerous and inexcusable. And get this, it happened in their parking lot. These are the nails that we found. Deputy Police Chief Reed Baer showed us the small nails that flattened tires on seven of the department's patrol vehicles. At least two employees also had damage to their cars, along with others who came to the department through the west entrance off of 4th Street. This not only puts citizens at danger, it puts police officers in danger, it damages property, and it costs taxpayer money. All of those things come together to make this a cowardly, uh, stupid act. Please share this photo of an officer collecting the small nails with a huge magnet. Right now, they don't have a motive behind the vandalism, but Michael Ritchie, who has repaired tires for 40 years, says the small nails can do a lot of damage. Yes, sir, they could actually puncture a tire, uh, and especially if you get a bunch of them. You know, if you get two or three or four of them in there at one time, it could go down pretty quick. Tonight, police are reviewing surveillance video from a half dozen cameras around the building. Those who live nearby hope the person is caught. Something really important could be going on and that's preventing them from going to help. I think that's really unacceptable. Investigators have found the remains of a Georgia woman who went missing on Valentine's Day. 23-year-old Anitra Gunn was a student at Fort Valley State University. Her body was discovered in Crawford County Tuesday afternoon. Officials say she was last seen with Demarcus Little, who is considered a person of interest. They say he vandalized her car and apartment about two weeks ago. He is now under arrest, facing charges of criminal damage to property. Officials say a deputy found Gunn's body in the woods along with the front bumper of her car. Uh, about 150 yards off the roadway, he found a piece of the car, part of the car piece that we've been looking for, uh, found Miss Gunn laying very close to part of that front bumper. 
A school district in Madison, Wisconsin is facing a lawsuit over its gender identity policy. It prohibits staff from telling parents if their children alter their gender identity at school, but some parents believe they have the right to know. A lawsuit filed Tuesday names eight anonymous families in Madison who claim their rights as parents are violated by Madison Metropolitan School District. I'm not aware of any other example uh, where a district takes an issue as significant as this and as controversial as this uh, and takes it out of parents' hands. A 2018 policy teaches staff how to support transgender students, allowing kids to change their gender identity in school without parent approval. The policy prohibits staff from even notifying parents about this without the child's consent. Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty attorney Luke Berg says the 14 parents filing suit don't have transgender children, but feel they have a right to know what their kids are doing in school. They need to challenge the policy now so that if their children ever do deal with this issue, they can be involved in part of the process. The lawsuit itself is just um, um, just immediately having harm on students and families. Brian Jukum's organization G-SAFE works with schools to develop inclusive policies. It's really critical to our trans students um, and it really allows them to learn and feel supported. He says Madison's policy leads in best practices, allowing schools to give kids another place to get help if they're not comfortable at home. This is a really scary process for young people, for anybody to share something really personal in it, uh, about themselves. But the parents involved in the lawsuit disagree, calling for a court order to change the policy to require a parent's permission for any gender identity changes. This is the kind of thing that parents need to be involved in to help guide their children through it. When a retail worker found $5,000 in cash at work, she could have easily pocketed the money. That's not what one Kentucky woman did, and she thinks her actions brought her good karma. Words cannot express our appreciation for you today. God for Katrina Dini Thomas, this is one thank you card that was worth every penny of five grand. When I went to pick it up, it was awful heavy. I found it right here. And it was right there for the taking. $5,000 in cash left on the floor in front of her workstation inside the Maysville Rural King, and she didn't even think twice. God put me to put it back. He, he, he was the one that directed me to give it back. Her coworkers could have told you all along that's what she would have done. Everything she does, she, do, she does 100 percent. So, you know, it was not a shock at all that she turned it in. Left her husband of 42 years beaming with pride. I was proud that she was going to turn it back in because, you know, it, somebody really needed the money. But it was the thought that counts. And a reward would follow, consisting of flowers, candy, and of course that card. God bless you and hope you have a very special Valentine's Day. Hand delivered by the person who accidentally dropped the envelope, with a little something extra, of course. Let me give you a big hug. I said, you're welcome. I said, you know, it could have been somebody else that didn't turn it in. But it was Katrina who did, showing she was all heart on February 14th. On Valentine's Day, they got a Valentine's gift back. Thanks to a saint, everyone calls Deanie. The men's basketball team breaks 100 points in a hotly contested Peach Belt game at home. And Brave Softball is still looking to get back in the swing of things. It's Ty the Sports Guy when we come back. What's going on, Brave Nation? Welcome back to another week of Brave Sports. I'm Ty the Sports Guy. Let's start with women's basketball who face up against USC Aiken Wednesday. It was neon night for UNCP and the crowd, Bravehawk, and all of our athletes were feeling the energy at the Lumbee Guarantee Bank Court. The team matched a season best with 11 three-pointers. A late push in the fourth quarter from USC Aiken tied up the game at 62, but luckily the Braves knocked down 16 for 18 from the free throw line to help seal the victory. Five players also scored in double digits, including senior Shania Lester, who led the Braves in scoring with 18 points to help give head coach John Haskins his 300th combined victory as the head coach of both men's and women's programs at UNCP. Final score of the game, 77-71. After the game, Shania Lester described her plans for heading into the next game. My mentality going to the next game is basically the same. Continue to work hard on both ends um, to keep uplifting my teammates, be able to knock down shots when my number is called. And that's pretty much it. 
Men's basketball faced up against USC Aiken as well, and the highlights got brighter, literally. Continuing on through Neon Night, men's basketball broke out the neon yellow jerseys. So not only were they looking sharp, but they also were competing for first place in the Peach Belt Conference standings. The team shot better than 57% from the field in both halves. Tyrell Kirk led in points with a game-high 22 points and assists with 10. Four other Braves scored in double digits as well. USC Aiken's head coach, Mark Vanderslice, was tossed out of the game for unsportsmanlike conduct with the referee, who already gave a warning to both sides beforehand. In the closing minutes of the game, the Braves broke away with the energy from the crowd and decided to put on a show with an accidental alley-oop from Tyrell to Spencer Levi. And then a behind-the-back pass from Tyrell to Akia Pruitt for the slam. And finally, a makeup dunk for Tyrell to give the crowd exactly what they wanted. The Braves take the win, 109 to 89, to improve their record to 20 and 5. The next day, Coach Jones talked about his players' focus and their depth on the bench. We were just a lot more focused this game. Uh, first half, you know, Aiken's a really good team, and they came out fighting, and so did we. In the second half, made some adjustments. They listened, executed, and you know, things went well. I never worry about who was subbing in. It's just, you know, making sure that they go in and execute. They're great players with talent at 1 through 10, and having that, um, that depth really helps. Golf traveled to Lakeland, Florida to compete in the Lady Mock Classic against a stacked field of nationally ranked teams. Senior Katie Flax carded a 10 over par the first day and a 4 over par the second to be placed in a four-way tie for 42nd place individually. UNCP finished 15th out of 16 groups the first day and then 14th out of 16 the second. The Braves will be back in action on Monday when they travel to Hilton Head, South Carolina for the Barton-hosted Battle at Hilton Head. Baseball traveled to Wilson, North Carolina to take on Barton College. It was a tough back and forth battle between the two teams, but Barton tallied together five home runs and a couple of runs along with intense defensive performance in the ninth inning to defeat the Braves 8-7. Ethan Bochum registered the only home run from the Braves, along with RBIs from him and four of the players. Braves baseball will be back in action this weekend when they take on USC Aiken. Softball took on Catawba this past weekend in a doubleheader. The team has been trying to bounce back from a four-game losing streak. In Game 1, the Braves were only able to send in one run, while Catawba tallied three RBIs to take Game 1 3-1. In Game 2, Catawba connected on 13 hits to send in seven total runs. The Braves, on the other hand, couldn't find a rhythm and only finished with two runs scored. Braves softball has now lost six of their last eight games. But during those eight games, Coach Brittany Bennett was able to acquire her 100th career win as a head coach. We asked Bennett what this milestone means to her. Well, it's funny, I had no idea. Um, clearly, I wasn't paying attention to this. I had no clue. Um, it caught me off guard um, when our, Mr. Christie, our athletics director, texted me about it because I didn't even know it was happening. When you say that number to me, it just, it, it sounds like a number to you and it's a milestone, but to me, it sounds like people, awesome conversations, growth, opportunity, success, and a whole lot of fun along the way, and maybe just a few tears from some of those kids, but I wouldn't be anywhere I am right now today if it hadn't been for those kids. The doubleheader against Wingate was postponed, so softball's next matchup is against West Virginia Tech this weekend. And that's all the Brave Sports updates I have for you this week. Until next time, I'm Ty the Sports Guy. Extasia, Samantha, back to you. Thanks, Ty. That's it for us. We'll be back next week. I'm Extasia Benjamin. And I'm Samantha DeBusk. Thanks for watching.